Hello, everybody. Avish from the marketing team at Zykis. I wish you all to today's webinar and appreciate the time that you all have taken out to come to this event today. I will briefly introduce today's presenter before we start with the presentation. So, Bill Michaels, who is the CEO of Aripat Consultant, as our speaker for today. Bill helps companies transform business strategies into maximum profits. He is being expert in purchasing and supply chain management. Bill is currently the CEO and founder of Aripat Consulting after more than 23 years at ADR North America. In consulting, Bill has worked with some of the world's greatest companies across a wide spectrum of industries and transforming procurement and supply chain. In purchasing and operations management community and in pharma industries, Bill is sought after speaker and writer with many publications, including co-author of the book Transform Your Supply Chain. Now working on a new book focused on the areas of supply relationship management and published a numerous articles. He has a BS in business administration from the Rochester Institute of Technology and an MB from Baldwin Wallace University. He has CPSM, CPM, and SCIPS certifications also. He is the board of directors of Joey Elko Foundation. Over to you, Bill. Well, uh, good morning and, uh, to everyone, and, and uh, um, I, I hope that uh, we can really have a great discussion about uh, metrics, open uh, open to questions. I've visited lots of companies in my consulting career. I've visited lots of companies and still visit lots of companies across the globe, and some of them are very effective at uh, measurement, and others are measuring for the sake of measuring. So it's my hope through this, this webinar that we can actually help you make sure that you get the right metrics and help your organization through. Uh, a little look at the agenda is we're, go we're going to talk about what the uh, CEOs really want from purchasing and supply chain. And we're going to talk about what are the need metrics. And then I've got a matrix that talks about how confident are we in developing metrics. And then we'll look at uh, building effective uh, key performance indicators and we'll look at 10 metrics, or per, actually it's going to be more than 10. I put quite a bit in there. So we'll look at uh, some of the metrics for purchasing and supply chain, and you guys can take a, a thought about how how can we uh, measure, what should we be measuring, and what's best practice in measuring. So that's that's really what we're going to look at today. Uh, what, do CPO, uh, what do CEOs want from the purchasing and supply chain functions? Well, and we'll start with the process. They want a good, lean, effective process. And as we see more and more industry consolidations, we're actually going to see um, uh, a greater need uh, to have a good process, interlink our process with our supplier's process, have a good supplier relationship process that delivers value and, uh, and, and competitive advantage. So they're really going to be looking at the process side and how well we we manage in uh, in a in a tighter world with a lot of consolidation. <clears throat> I don't think if, if you're in the procurement or supply chain world, cost is never going to go off your agenda. So this is uh, going to have CEOs demanding cost improvement, and that cost improvement is going to come from um, really aligning with suppliers. Uh, once once we get transparency across the supply chain, we're going to really understand. Uh, what our suppliers' margins are, what the costs are, and then we're all going to have to work together to change specifications or or or, or make investments, joint investments that are going to deliver year-on-year -year cost improvement forever with actual costs coming out of the process. Another thing that's coming on to uh, CEO's agenda is they want value improvement. So they want speed to market. They want revenue generation from the supply base. They're expecting uh, total cost of ownership, and, uh, and uh, they, they want um, the uh, in incremental value covered across the supply chain. And we'll talk about how to measure some of those things. Uh, and, you know, they really want uh, the supply to be assured. They want risk-free supply base, and, and risk is an area where it's, you know, we have to be careful about how we measure. Because I, I can't tell you how many times I go into a uh, – group of folks and ask them to uh, uh, tell me if they have a risk management plan, they say yes, and then I ask them how many people go beyond the first tier, and my hands come down. The reality is 
I saw one supply chain not too long ago where um, everybody in the primary tier was great, but three tiers down, they were all using one supplier. Uh, there was a hidden risk in the supply chain. And one of the other clients I have wanted a predictive model uh, that told them exactly what the risk was going to be over the next 10 years. And so, you know, linking on with Aon, we actually did that. So, you know, they want, they want to make sure that we're risk-free and they want suppliers' investment and a return on investment from the suppliers in, uh, in working in our business. So they do want some kind of quality. Uh, you know, when we go to this uh, process, I mean, it's really we want efficient uh, purchase A, and it's get more and more critical as we get more and more linkages into a consolidated supply base. Uh, you know, that, that efficiency uh, is going to be critical. Not only that efficiency is uh, going to be critical, but, you know, the Internet of Things is going to link our supply chains together. So we'll know what we're making, how to make it, when to make it, and when to pay for it. So we, we're expecting those linkages to occur in the, in the future. In the next five to ten years, you'll see those, those linkages. They also want a lean supply chain, all the waste and all the redundancy going away. Uh, and that's important in terms of looking at our process. And, and I've already talked about, you know, um, supplier relationship management. Uh, cost, uh, continuous improvement is another thing that's look, that we're looking for in process. And I've talked about risk management. And we want speed, velocity, and flexibility. So we want to turn on a dime. We want to be able to make uh, changes as quickly as we can. And we want our, um, our suppliers to be able to support that. In there's, there's cost improvement, there's the total cost of ownership approach, which you know, we're starting to look at. What is the real cost? So there's a lot of talk about trade. What's the real cost of having inventory on the ocean and, and bringing it across and holding the inventory and pretend risk of change and pretend risk of terrorism? Those costs are, are not usually figured in when we, we look at, you know, some of our, our items. So we want to look at what is the total cost of of really buying an item and what's this life cycle cost. So that's a, a thing we're starting to look at. The other thing is alignment to the business strategy. You know, one of the things that's critical is that we are always aligned to the business strategy and our suppliers are aligned to the business strategy. We expect year-on-year -year cost improvement. And I said that as we get closer and more transparent and understand the cost, we're going to wind up target costing and working with suppliers in a way that provide increased uh, changes in specification, potential opportunities to invest, all kinds of things that we're going to be looking for to maintain year-in-year -year improvement. But year improvement is not going to come from suppliers' margin alone. Year-in-year -year improvement is going to come from actually working across the supply chain, eliminating waste, and focusing on where can we improve specifications and investments. You, uh, we should be able to do should cost and could cost modeling. We're not going to be able to get year-on-year -year cost improvement unless we have a good handle on what the uh, what the cost across the supply chain is. And then as we start to look forward, we want to make sure that we're uh, taking a look at the supply base itself. And, you know, I went to one client and found 350,000 suppliers. And to another, it had 77,000 suppliers. So, one of the things, and we'll talk about it in the metric side, is where is our supply base and where should it be? What's the optimal number and how do we measure our effectiveness in, in keeping the right supply base in intact? So, so there are some of the things that, that we expect in the cost improvement area. In the value improvement area, I think, you know, the CEOs are expecting speed market, increased services, what, meeting all of the voice of the customers, making sure, especially in indirect, making sure that we're meeting the uh, bid requirements and the need of the uh, the customers that we support, and along the supply chain with customer demand for value. So value is continuing to increase. Really generation is one of the values, and, and also um, you know, uh, we and and uh, life cycle products are part of value. So we'll have to talk about that and how do we measure that as we move forward. And then finally. We're looking at capturing supplier investments. We want to make sure that suppliers are investing, that we're growing together, that the machine's getting quicker, we're linking in technologies uh, like IoT and, and uh, uh, AI, artificial intelligence. We want to make sure that one of the things that's kind of interesting, and uh, one thing that I, I really took away from something Pierre Mitchell said, he said, we're picking our first 
supplier. When we're finally doing supplier selection, we're not picking a supplier, but we're making sure that we architect the whole supply chain. And I think that that's really a critical piece, and, and that's something that uh, I, I thought was very, very valuable, and I think it's something that we should think about every time we make a supplier selection. We have a flexible sourcing networks, so when we're looking at supply, we, you know, as I see it in the future with consolidation, we're going to see competing supply chains, and as we see competing supply chains, we better have one that is lean and effective and can do it. We want to get the best sourcing solutions, and that means that, you know, it fits and it's a fit. Look at the cost of change and everything we do. And then we want to make sure that we guarantee assurance of supply, which is one of the things I said. So these are kinds of the things that SEALs um, uh, are, are looking for and they're expecting from procurement and the supply chain. And they're the kinds of things that we all have to keep on top of to be able to manage um, effectively um, the, the supply chain. So let's look at what kind of metrics do we have? And so what are some of the problems that we see that I see? Here's some of the problems I see when I go around with metrics. There's team. We can't keep track of them all. We don't have the important ones in some in some companies. Some companies, they, they, they say they're doing data cleansing all the time, but, you know, when you look at the metrics, it's bad data. And it reflects bad on the company, and you can't do any kinds of improvement unless you know exactly where you are. Old data. You know, there's not timely data reporting, not timely. Uh, another problem with, with data. So you really need some kind of, uh, of uh, system to make sure that your data is clean, it's referral of time, and when measuring, you're measuring accurately. Another big challenge across, uh, across a lot of companies is what, what exactly do we measure? Who determines what we measure? Um, do, we, do we align with the suppliers to measure the same things the suppliers are measuring? Our suppliers align with our business to make sure they know how we use that product. So that's kind of kind of one of the things. And, and then one of the other things that I've seen in, in my consulting career is consistently changing metrics. They can't they can't zero in on a metrics and you know they um, you know, maybe maybe the manufacturing process or, or even as an indirect supplier, it's not working the way we want it to. So we change the metrics, make it harder, and we never really consider whether. Um, we're meeting the capability. In fact, in one of the, one of my corporate jobs in the food industry, uh, the you know, food depends on sunshine, all the ingredients for food, and some of the plants, the sunshine, oil, you know, amount of uh, uh, rain, and and you know, to get that down to six sigma is very difficult. So uh, I, I worked in companies where they were consistently changing the metrics, and they didn't know exactly what the and uh, everything that they were producing was going to deliver. So I think that that's interesting. And then um, you got to be careful that some parties within the organization and stakeholders don't manipulate the data uh, to support one of their own uh, activities. So that's a, that's a piece. This is something, you know, that I, I've learned along the way and, and um, um, something that my colleagues once said, what's measured gets managed. If you don't measure it, you don't manage it. So it's really important to understand what do you really want to manage and what are really going to be the optimal results for your company. Metrics have to be meaningful to generate results. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about competence, and I'm going to give you a, a sort of a matrix to start thinking about. All right. Well, my competence relies on knowing what to measure, making sure we have meaningful uh, key performance indicators, really getting organization buy-in on those those metrics and capturing those metrics. Using the information as, it, as it's generated is another key point because you can do correct action as soon as you see anything not working the way you want it to. And you can focus the direction of activity and, and you can focus people and, uh, and the company on the right measurement tool. So, those are the kinds of things that we look at with competence. When we're talking about measurement competence, uh, results, change, change in metrics generate positive return. Change how you re, 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 uh, uh, results from changing the focus, and that you get increased productivity, value, cost uh, improvement, and the organization and stakeholders accept it, 
and we generate accountability for change. So those are the two things that I'm going to use for accesses. And we got the measurement confidence, all those things that we talked about just in the in uh, one, one slide ago, and the results. So if we have low measurement confidence and low results, we're in net. If we have um, low measurement uh, confidence and um, we have low high results, we're, we're paralyzed. And I'll explain each of these. If we have high measurement confidence and 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 uh, I'm sorry, low uh, low measurement competence and high results, we're optimistic. And then if we have high uh, measurement competence and high results, we're really uh, driven. So let's take a look at all these in a little bit more detail. When we're in the paralysis side, a lot of time um, companies spend too much time measuring and analyzing um, the you know, metrics. They really don't have the ability to move into action and make that changing. And chances are, um, the, mean, the metrics aren't really that meaningful. So that's, uh, uh, that's not really a place where we want to be. Uh, if we're driven, we get continuous improvement. We are always getting uh, change changes for positive. It's always resulting in, in, in improvement in cost, value, um, delivery, uh, ability to meet our customer needs. And we really have maybe aligned the right responsibilities, authorities, and accountabilities. So, you know, this, this, if you're good in the culture has an excellence and, uh, for class and, and, and action, and they take action right away, and it's probably a really good place to be in. And I thought matrix was kind of interesting, and I thought you'd like it. If, if you're an app, uh, you do a lot of measuring. You don't have the right metrics in place. Uh, you don't have the ability to specify and capture the metrics. And um, you really uh, can't make a change. It's not a natural process in your business. So if you can, if you can support and think about some of your metrics in, in these four dimensions, I think that that will make a big difference in terms of how, how we look at things. And then optimistic, uh, maybe an empowered culture, and we have a lot of issues. Uh, it's pe probably people dependent, and and, uh, and we have a proven process, but. Uh, Really, got to take the, those opportunities and, and that, that optimistic attitude and make them uh, into and continuous improvement. So, you know, we make sure that all the indicators that we put in place are key performance indicators. We want sure that we're uh, sure stakeholder buy-in that we get it. We report regularly what we're doing, and, and we've got our roles done, and we actually move forward and get continuous improvement because that's the goal of measurement. If you're not getting improvement, then you might as well hang it up. Uh, so the goals have to be acceptable across the culture and the organization, because sometimes uh, getting getting that together is not really that easy. Of course, obviously time, uh, timely and, and compatible and comparable uh, and simple. The simpler the metric, the better. Uh, it's got to be linked to responsibility so we know where to go and who's got the authority and the capability and responsibility and accountability for fixing it. You can't spend a fortune building tools to try and create measurements. They gotta be balanced. They gotta be customer focused and, and, and if they're not meaningful, then you're wasting your time, your energy and your money. So those are kind of the key things. Uh, and then I can't say enough how important it is to make sure that we get stakeholder buy-in and alignment and that we collaborate on key metrics. I've been in organizations where um, our quality department was real set about some uh, some of the quality metrics. Uh, we got uh, only to go there, spend a lot of time and energy collaborating with the supplier to find out that neither of us are measuring uh, what we need to measure for the product that we're making. And I've done that over and over again to the point where I always make sure that we aligned at the beginning, that we have the same metrics we're all looking at, and that everybody understands what the goal of the metric is. Uh, effective measurement is going to really drive supplier performance. And, and where, we're, where we're really important and where we're driving the performance with delivering value to the organization and continuous improvement. All right, so um, metrics are realized cost savings and, and risk management, which we've already talked about. And certainly, revenue, revenue from supplier innovation is, is one we've got to consider, All right? So there's a bit of, uh, of source 
pricing uh, and supply chain metrics we got to look at. Uh, I'm going to move into the point of the key performance indicators and measuring the key performance and how we get there. When we're looking at key performance indicators, they've got to be quantifiable. You have to be able to uh, take action on them. You've got to um, make sure that they are aligned to the business and that they deliver uh, increased value to the business and continuous improvement. They're tied to business goals and targets that could be aligned. I, I think that people have too many metrics, and I think five to eight, I think on the, the five side would be ideal, but you no, know, like the five to eight, it, it, you, you, I, I would really lit down to those metrics that are going to make a difference to your organization. They can be applied consistently to the organization. They got to be agreed with stakeholders. They can't be vague. They can't be unclear. They can't be uh, a, a, a total list of exhaustive metrics. They can't be something that the, um, can flip the suppliers and the suppliers can refute. Um, they can't be one-sided. And it just can't be we're putting metrics in and we're checking off a box. So it doesn't matter what they are. And they can't be random. And, you know, they, they can't be developed without supplier input. So as we start to think about these key performance indicators, we want to make sure that they're good. And at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we put a process in place that's feedback to the suppliers. And sometimes it's a, it can be on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, but I wouldn't recommend an annual basis. Suppliers really want to know um, how they're performing. We want to know how we're performing. And I think that the, the, the closer we can get to um, being on how we support the data, what we do, and how we report it, and how we take action on it is going to be a critical piece of, of our uh, they can't be we, we can't put them in to punish the supply. I know I've had lots of uh, quality folks in the past, both on the direct, direct and indirect side. Uh, and stakeholders that really want to put a mechanism in to beat the crap out of the supplier, and that's not really what we want to do. They can't be wish lists. We want to get here, so we'll make the metrics high, uh, and and that deliberately always causes a failure. It can't, I already talked about the long list. We can't really have a long list. We have to have a reasonable no metrics that really generate the right thing. It can't tactical tool either. Uh, just to transfer the risk. And I, I've seen lots and lots of uh, companies where, you know, a specification is very difficult or a service is very difficult, and we put metrics in place to make sure that we don't have the risk and the supplier does it and he doesn't, uh, he or she fails. We can't have that either. And it's got to be something that we can achieve together and make work. You know, here, here's a great slide. I borrowed this from uh, ADR International, and it really says, you know, get value. We've set the KPIs. We've got to look at the cause and effect relationship. We understand the improvement we're looking to get, the learning curve, and the kinds of agreements we need to put in place. We do implement the changes and, and, and really uh, switch thinking from um, a, uh, a bad product or a bad service to really how we're going to generate more value from this process. And I think that that's the kind of a, uh, thinking I like to do. So, you know, what, what we want to do is some of the metrics are going to be supplier-driven, some are going to be buyer-driven, but they're, they're, at the end of the day, they've got to be unbiased. They can't, they can't go um, to uh, uh, one way or another. Um, can't be unbalanced. They gotta make sure that we're generating value. They can't be misaligned. We can't be looking for uh, cost and value on the supplier, looking for optimal margin increase. We've, we've got to make sure that that we're aligned on our KPIs and that, that we're good. And we have to make sure that the targets work and that we can achieve the targets. So I've said that before, but I think uh, I think those are really important as we look at that, you know how are we gonna uh, how are we gonna address performance and poor performance. And with the right metrics in place, we can help it. Here's just a couple examples of, uh, of some KPIs of customer service, on-time delivery, inventory, accuracy, um, just some, some examples of how that might look. And then we have to think about measuring and evaluating. Okay, what gets measured gets measured. I've said that before. How, what's the progress being made? You know, are we working uh, across a uh, 
a down cycle of, you know, uh, this improvement. Move away from intuitive decisions to objective and logical, and we've got to support the core principles of strategic sourcing as part of our thing. It's really thinking about it. It's a strategic tool. Uh, it needs to reflect the uh, business needs. It's fair when we think about what the KPIs have to be. We use them as levers, not penalties. And entry criteria has to ha and who owns it has to be really clear. So our goal again is to motivate people within the industry and then drive our continuous improvement to the next level. So 10 key metrics that we want to look at. I've got a few more that I'll talk about. Um, I'll add to the end of this list and, and uh, uh, some of my favorites. So well, why don't I start with those? before I start this list. So one of the ones that, uh, that I'll go to uh, and I'll, I'll um, do in an organization is a zero-based measurement. So I'll pick a date and time like January 1st, maybe the first of the fiscal year, and then from that point forward, I'll measure all of the um, increases, price increases that are occurring, and all of the price decreases that are occurring. And I'll measure, and I'll deduct uh, the increases from the decreases and look at the net. You're either above the line or below the line. It's a pretty easy metric to think about. But that's one that's organizationally difficult, uh, been difficult for some, but those companies that put it in, even if they have a their cost system, uh, find that that's very, very accurate, and you can do it right down to the buyer level. Uh, one that's kind of interesting that uh, people don't talk about is uh, uh, supply-based concentration. So one of the things that uh, I mentioned earlier in the webinar, I've gone and seen supply bases as big as 365,000 or, or as uh, 71,000. The, the question is, what right? Where do you get the right concentration? So one of the one of the uh, uh, people use is Pareto. You know, what, how many suppliers own 80% of our business? And we usually find it's usually less than 20 in, in a lot of companies. So. Um, so the, really, just focus on where do we want to make the, the uh, KPS and which suppliers are going to generate benefit for us. So while while everything below the 20 or 30 uh, or in 100, if you're a really large company, is going to be important. But you know the most value is going to come from the uh, con concentration of suppliers. Another one that that I'll talk about is compliance to contract. So how how good are we at, at getting people to follow the contracts that we put in place? And, you know, what, what's the spend under contract? And, and how, how well do people uh, work on contract? And this is really important if you're in a decentralized company and you're looking at something like some of the indirect uh, categories that go across all companies or even direct uh, initiatives that go across companies. You really care about, you know, what's the spend under contract and then how well do those uh, – uh, People in the or uh, in the um, divisions manage, manage, and, and uh, agree with the, the contracts. And how many mavericks do you have? Moving to my chart, um, key metrics. Well, certainly realized and implemented cost savings is, is really important. So not only not only what cost savings have you generated, but what have you generated and what have actually hit the P and L. Uh, so this is this. Is very easy to do in direct materials and indirect materials. You have another issue, uh, which is um, sometimes you'll generate a savings. Uh, let's say I'm working in a maintenance area and I generate a million dollar savings. Well, you know that maintenance manager, if it's in his budget, can do a million dollars more savings and uh, a million dollars more spend, and uh, never see the savings in the P&L. And I always try to put in a process to manage that. That's I call that uh, savings vaporization. So what happens is we generate these numbers in indirect and say, hey, we're doing really well with this. And the CEO comes out and says, no, man. no you're not. It's not the P&L. Travel is another one where you can save lots of money in travel, and people do more travel because they have the money in their budget. So you really have to have a process that actually manages and captures those, those kinds of cost savings and that the business acknowledges and decides whether they take it out of the budget or they, they spend the money. ROI. So it's really the total spend savings implemented by purchasing and the labor benefits and outsourcing, only the actual savings uh, qualify. So really, you know, if you how, how much does it cost you for the procurement department and how much are you generating in terms of revenue, uh, re revenue or value? 
The next kind of a tough one, cost avoidance. Uh, I, I think that's uh, really tough because uh, most people don't measure correctly. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll have an 8% increase and negotiate it down to 5 and say they save 3. Uh, I don't look at it that way. I say that they avoided 3 and, uh, and, they, and, they, and they increased the price 5. So, you know, on a percent cost, in, uh, cost increase, um, you know, if you negotiate out 3%, that's the avoidance, and then 5% is an increase. So people mix, mixed up about how they do that. And even, even in some of the capital equipment, as avoidance a problem where we got a first bid from a supplier, then we negotiate and we get it down, we call that a cost savings. No, we didn't call it a cost. It's not a cost savings. It's cost avoidance. We could have spent that, but we didn't. Now, a lot of people get upset with me when I talk about that as an issue, but, um, you know, as, as, we have to really be accurate about the way we measure things. Management is really how a process for how much risk do you have in the supply base and how do you improve risk. And like I said, I had one client that actually went through and profiled the entire supply base and supply chain and went out after uh, risk. And then I think you have to think about what are you trying to achieve, you know, I think most companies would be really great if they set a, a metric to at least map the supply chain and they know where all the points of, uh, uh, of risk are, and that's, that's a key piece. Uh, incremental revenue from supplier innovation. What has the supplier brought into you that's really driven the cost down and, and really made the customer appreciation go up? So that's another one that you can look at. Payment terms is really an interesting one because most companies have stretched their terms pretty seriously. I've seen a anything from 45 to 180 days in some of the clients that I work with, and I think that it's okay right now while money's free. I hear you know, there's going to be an opportunity for um, um, problems if, in fact, the interest rates raise the three year or five percent uh, uh, that people are, are projecting. So we'll see what interest rates do. Uh, it's going to be three, uh, three hits this year. We don't know what they're going to be, but it's certainly going to impact suppliers on the front end of the supply chain. Uh, I have seen one, one best practice where um, uh, are giving a variable terms. So you pick the terms you want to work with uh, under a certain discount schedule. So that might be a, a better opportunity to, to chin and uh, might be a good way to get suppliers aligned with what you want to do. We also measure on-time delivery. Some of the re big retailers measure uh, to the hour, to the minute, and uh, uh, they want to see 99% uh, on-time full uh, full orders. So that's a good one. time. Lead time costs you money. So if you've got a long lead time, you have to carry inventory. So if you have a process that reduces supplier lead time and you know, one company I worked with, they had a uh, very elaborate motor that had a, a six-week time. When we got into the motor, we found it was a special D-shaft that caught lead time. So we just produced the D-shafts and left them in the supplier's inventory, so the lead time was knocked down to, like, two weeks. So, you know, getting into what's causing the lead time and really driving a metric on how do I, how do I reduce the time and how do I increase the cash. That's as important as your terms. And then I don't have to go into supplier quality. That's a key metric. Purchasing some time, how long does it take you to go from the store possession all the way through the buy? It's another one. Uh, and I've just seen a couple of supply chain, other supply chain uh, um, metrics, just, just for the fun of it, uh, outside of the 10 procurement ones. Order accuracy, the percentage of orders are error-free. That's a key one. Customer order cycle time, so here's how long it takes uh, to deliver to a customer after get the PO, inventory turnover, how quickly do we move our inventory, cash cycle. So if you've got a system like, like I guess, you're e you can measure some of these pretty easy uh, with the ERP that are a good procurement system that lets you do this. And then, you know, the supply chain cycle time is the time it would take to fill a customer um, if the uh, inventory levels were zero. So there's some of the other metrics that you might want to think about when we uh, when we look at metrics. Some of our cycle measures how long it takes to deliver a customer after the PO's received. Fill rate, you know, how, you know, what percentage do you fill it uh, on the first shipment? Those are key supply chain metrics that you think about. 
And uh, that's it. So if I uh, have any questions, um, I'm open to, to having questions and really have a great discussion with people. Uh, thank you, Bill, for the presentation. Uh, so we have, you know, open the flow for questions and uh, question and answer. So if you guys have any questions, you might uh, post them. You can see a, a create box on the top right of your screen. Just type in your question over there, and Bill will be answering all your questions. No question. So we have our first question, Bill. Uh, why don't management place more emphasis on cost avoidance? Well, I mean, I, I, I think it's because what we explained in the, in the presentation, we didn't, we don't really uh, measure correctly. I mean, so a lot of people take credit for uh, avoidance, like, uh, like I said, if they're buying a piece of capital equipment uh, and they get a first offer, and then they negotiate with the supplier and get that, you know, get it greatly reduced using their team and everybody. Uh, they call that a savings. It's not a savings. We didn't we didn't really save any money. We weren't spending any money. We avoided it. Uh, and I think what what happens is we have CEOs that uh, uh, CEOs that really uh, want real money. When, so when we're calculating, they want real money, and avoidance isn't real money. Avoidance is the impact that you had uh, uh, on the um, on the business. The impact that if you weren't there. They would have they would have experienced. So uh, I think that you know while while I like to report that 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 avoidance is there, I want to report it accurately too. I want to report that you know we've got um, we had a like, like I explained during we had an 80 percent uh, raise. We were good and we we drove it back three percent, but we still have five percent increase. But our impact would have been eight percent had we not been there. And I think that the way you have to explain that to uh, management is this is the impact. So I think that's critical. Okay. So thank you for the answer. We have one more question over here. Uh, going back to the cost avoidance part, do you have any issues explaining that or promoting the concept with management? Well, I think it's it's really it, it's really how we 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 present, it. and I think we have to say that you know is here is. The impact that purchasing had uh, on the business. If we, if you didn't have anybody here doing this, it would have been, uh, it would have been much, much greater uh, impact than than, uh, uh, than than you had. And I think as, as we start to see the economy heat up, and if we start to see some of these interest rate changes, that cost avoidance and uh, price increases uh, is going to be on the agenda again. I think that's a topic for another webinar, which is price increase resistance management. It's going to be on the agenda. I don't know how soon it'll it'll hit, but we all should be starting to think about that. And avoidance is a key part of price increase management. Uh, well, uh, we have one more question over here. Do you have some suggestions regarding starting to assign a risk rating to each supplier? And also, how would you outline a program to determine this? Say that one again. I'm sorry, I didn't hear it very well. Uh, have suggestions regarding starting to assign a risk rating uh, to each supplier. So, how would you outline a program to determine this? Well, I think I think you know, get getting when we're starting to sit down about the supplier, we need to have uh, our our cross functional stakeholder in there, and we need to understand uh, what we're trying to improve. How can we align it to the business? The business. How can we get uh, uh, our, our stakeholders engaged? And, and everybody has to agree. These are these are going to be the metrics. Then we have to look at who who's going to be primarily responsible for what part. So who's going to measure it? Who's going to who's going to evaluate it? Who's going to understand what the process needs to how this process needs to change or how we need to change? And then we're going to have to incorporate the supplier in that as well to be able to develop. Uh, metrics and assign, and maybe maybe we have accountability across multiple functions and multiple opportunities and the supplier. So I think that that's the kind of thing that we have to do. I mean, I in my my own career, one of the things I had to do was I had to uh, uh, introduce a uh, 
uh, um, statistical process control and a couple suppliers. And one in particular um, was a supplier of packaging. They made the uh, five-gallon pails. And well, what we what we did was we we started to go to statistical process control. We started to look at the process, and then working with the supplier together, our engineering, our quality teams, we, we recognized quickly that, that the supplier was trying to put over four pounds of resin, three point two pounds of resin in the uh, in the in the uh, pail. And by the time uh, the plastic got to the top, it was kind of solidifying. And um, what the operators were doing were they were putting too much, pla they were increasing the pressure and putting more pressure, more plastic in, which made the pails break. Uh, and, and once we did that, we, uh, we got the machine settings right, and, and we, um, we were able to get the, uh, over half a million dollar savings for the supplier and improve quality in our own process. And everybody uh, walked away happy. So uh, that included the suppliers, the engineering people, the quality people, people on our on our distribution center, uh, and and uh, and the, uh, it, it took about I think it took about eight weeks to get that all worked out. But then we never had another failure. So uh, it was very very important. Hey, I see that someone wants to look at slide 27 again. So let me go back and see if I can find that one. Let's see what. One more, one more. All right, but, okay, the, the KDIs and the process side. So I, I think, you know, when we're looking at value optimization, one of the things we want to do is we want to set the KPIs, we uh, uh, implement the KPIs, and then and create um, a lot of improvement. So one of the things that we're looking for is we're looking for, you know, in, in setting the KPIs, what's the cause and effect? So the example I gave was, was, well, I, I was in uh, actually in the last business, and those five-gallon pails were breaking in uh, major food chains warehouses. So there it was. We want to set a target, so we don't want them to break anymore, and we wanted we wanted to fix it so that we didn't see that quality problem again, and then integrate it with our, our strategic long-term agreement. So those are some of the things we wanted to do. Um, so from there, we wanted to get a value shift, so we didn't have any pro problems anymore. We wanted to create new value, so we got a good product and it didn't break anymore. We wanted to close the loop uh, and, and really learn from it, and we did learn. We learned that, um, you know, well, that the, the supplier was, it was a supplier problem. The supplier didn't know until we started doing statistical process control. And, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, it was really great because there was a half a million dollars in savings, no more defects, and we shared the savings. And the defect and the defects. Defects alone would have benefited the supplier and us, but the fact that not only was there defects, but there was a reduction in material and and a cost savings that were generated, uh, all were massive cost savings. Because if you pick your uh, packaging in a in a, uh, a food warehouse, that's that's a nightmare. So those some of the things we did. And then we, we implemented a, a dashboard to make sure that we were getting the right change. After, after we got that change, we moved on to another, another aspect of the, of the product and, and another cost opportunity. So there was a generation and savings by not having a defect, a generating savings by saving material. And this process is really kind of harmonized, and that's how we did it. So uh, that, uh, hopefully that answers the question. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, Bill, for answering. So we have one more question over here. What kind of metrics can be put in place for the measure of value? That, that's, that's, a tough, that's a tough one because uh, um, it is a tough one because we really have to define uh, what value is. So uh, let me let me think of a couple examples. Well, one one example is it, I'm working in the construction industry, and you know while while it's really great to get a few dollars in the in the construction materials, one of the key things is that we're experiencing a labor shortage. And and uh, um, so if we can just get the construction building uh, synchronized so that all the, all the contractors show up at the right time, get it done, uh, it's more important to that uh, that company uh, get that building out and and sold so that they can. You know, all of the investment on the real estate, the building, the constructions, the contractors, and create their profit. The longer they wait, the more they dilute the opportunity. So that one is, is a pretty pretty quick measure. 
Um, I can think of another one where, where if you extend the life of a product. So I, I work in uh, in some industries where refractories and, and furnaces are, are important. And so we save a few cents on a brick, or we can create a brick that's going to generate and actually, one of the companies that, I, that um, I worked in, I think it was like $2 million a week to, uh, the, to put their uh, factory down, all right? So uh, they had to put their factory down for about four weeks to rebuild the, uh, the uh, uh, furnace. So you get an extra year life out of that brick, then that saved $4 million. And, and I don't think I could save that just negotiating off of the price of the product. So, you know, working with suppliers to get that value is important. So I don't know what an extended life is worth, but it, we can certainly measure that they lasted longer, that we uh, we put in this effort to make that change. So we have to start thinking in different dimensions when we start thinking in value. Speed market is critical. If I'm in the, in the pharmaceutical industry or the medical device industry, if I'm the first one to get FDA approval and get to the market, I don't know uh, how much cost savings it would take to have that competitive advantage. So I uh, have to start thinking about the value in terms of what are we trying to achieve and then measure whether we're achieving what we're trying to achieve, whether it's speed to market, longer life cycles, quicker quicker turn times, less less, uh, less product or new products, even even if we get a new product. Uh, those are all things that are, are hard to measure. But I can tell you, from my own experience, again, one of, one of the things that I did is I worked with one of my suppliers uh, on a problem we were having on our line, and they gave us technology. Defect rate was 60%, and after they gave us the technology, it went our our, our defect rate went to one and a half percent. So um, big big changes, and I think there's more money in the value side of the business than there is in the in cost reduction side of the business. I hope that helps. I believe that helped a lot, Bill, and also that uh, that answer did uh, answer one more question, which was asked by Gavi. The question was, can you give one more example of uh, when you would record something as cost savings and also cost avoidance? So that answer would have been justified the question. Okay, so that's great. I mean, cost savings is when you have uh, you're paying a price. Uh, let's take an item. You're paying five dollars a piece and knock it down to four dollars. That, that's unbeautiful. It's a dark, uh, you paid it before, it's a dollar times the quantity or a service. If you do the same, if you've got someone doing your HVAC and they do an inspection every year and charge you a fee and you reduce it and it not charge that fee anymore, that's a cost of savings. If you have uh, 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 done something, you haven't paid the price before and, and it's, uh, 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 you know, like take that piece of capital equipment. I'm, I buy a piece of capital equipment. Uh, they give me a quote of two hundred and fifty thousand. I work with a team. We do a cost profile. We knock it down to two twenty-five thousand. You really haven't saved anything because uh, you know you're going to pay two hundred twenty-five thousand. You may have done a great job in avoiding uh, other twenty-five thousand uh, through a through a negotiation, but you didn't really save anything. Thing. It's like that with a price increase too. Someone comes in and they tell you they're going to reduce, you're going to, they're going to increase the price five percent, and you get that increase knocked down to two percent. You increase the price two percent, and you avoided the price a two and a half percent. You you've avoided the price two and a half percent. So you really haven't uh, you haven't done anything. I mean, you still got a price increase of two and a half percent, and your impact has. Reduce the price increase by two and a half percent. So that's that's kind of how I look at it. Cost avoidance is not real money, but it certainly is the impact that you had on a potential a real business. And I think that's how you have to look at it. And if you're going to present it to your management, that's how you have to present it. Uh, well, uh, I have one last question. Uh, why don't more companies focus on value management? Why don't we focus on value management? Why don't we focus on value management? I think we need to, need to start focusing on value management. Um, you know, I see it as we start to get these, uh, uh, you know, there's so much margin you're going to get. And, and, you know, we still need healthy suppliers that are going to drive uh, innovation, speed to market, reinvestment, 
<coughs> excuse me, we're still going to have to have those suppliers. They still have to have a healthy margin, and we're not going to take all the margin away or they'll walk away from us and consider us nuisances. So, you know, we're going to have to look at where, where can we get more value, you know, incremental services, uh, you know, which are going to be the suppliers that are going to give us the value to meet our customer demands and give us competitive advantage. So I think we have to really start thinking about that as we, as we get more and more uh, uh, into the future and as we get better and, and we've gotten better and better at should cost models and could cost models. So we probably have great idea on uh, most of us, most of us should have a good idea on the transparency, um, transparency of our suppliers. And, and if we don't, that's a good place to start. But at the end of the day, once you hit that, uh, that, that, uh, um, sustainability point, then you got to start looking for where can you get more value from that supply base. And I think it's a critical, critical skill. And if you don't have it, just you need to start thinking about it because that's where we're going to go in the future. Uh, thank you. I believe we have no more questions left. Uh, so I thank you all for being a part of today's webinar. And if you have any more questions regarding the topic, you write to us at the email address provided on the screen. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending. I really, really appreciate it. And I uh, look forward to seeing some conferences and uh, seeing you again and talking to you again. Bye-bye.